Oregon and hopefully maybe we can get back to the in finance. I don't know why. Uh, he is, no, because he's currently a professor of geography at Stone State. And I know that if you take his classes, you'll find the field of geography, which you might think is just capitals of countries and things like that, to be one of the most interesting things you could probably imagine, because geography basically encompasses everything. <coughs> the, the whole planet and everything that the planet uh, is concerned with. Um, environmentally, socially, politically. Um, Professor Baldwin has published widely, covering a huge range of questions, from how beavers stalked the land with their dams to go forth and their cultivation of crops and cutting it down so much, um, to how we use and grow food. And I think that's the primary topic of this conversation today. Also, tourism and its impacts, um, and various, various uh, questions of environmentalism and sustainability. Please give a warm FOE welcome to Dr. Jeff Baldwin. Oops. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wait, can you hear me? All right. And food systems and um, climate change and the idea that free markets are the answer to our problems vis -vis food systems. So what is geography? Geography is not state capitals. I cannot name the state capitals. That's what wiki is for, yes? Okay, geography is for this. It's about understanding human environment relationships holistically. Not just one thing to one thing, but everything to everything as best as we can. It's about place. That's where we start. We look at what are the relationships in this place. And this can be an urban place. This can be a rural place. This can be a wild place. It can be a combination of those. And then we look at how places interact with each other, both humans and non-humans, plants and animals. We do life. We do the biosphere, basically. Some questions to think about while I'm talking. Uh, what is food insecurity? How does that happen? Are you food insecure? 15% of all CSU students are actually food insecure. They do not know where necessarily dinner is coming from tonight. Uh, how did the Green Revolution work? I'm going to talk about that briefly. I'm going to cover a lot today. It's going to be fast. The slides will be up on Moodle if you want to look at them later. I'm going to talk about this idea about neoliberalism, the idea that free markets are a way to address the problems that we're having in terms of food insecurity, food production on a global or a local scale. Um, then I want to talk about the role of climate change briefly near the end of this. And then maybe a little bit about what you can do about some of this stuff. Okay? This discussion in Western tradition starts with Thomas Malthus. 215 years ago, he's writing in London. He's looking at all these people moving into London. And he's experiencing what he perceives as a population explosion. More and more people all the time. Not enough food to feed these people. And he's looking at this agricultural science, agronomy, and yes, in Britain in 1798, food production was increasing. Each year, it was increasing, right? So we could feed more people. But what Malthus said is, people aren't increasing at this rate. People are increasing at an exponential rate. Each couple has four children. Each of those four children have, with another couple, four children. So this generation, we have two people. Next generation, four. Next generation, eight. Then 16. Then 32. Then 64. Then 128. On and on. That's what exponential growth is. Question is, can the food supply grow as fast as the population is growing? And what he said was, no, it won't. And we're going to run into famine here. And we have to do something about this. It's interesting to read his treatise. It's uh, 18 pages long. He's incredibly classist. He blames all of this on the lower classes. None of this is the upper classes problem, because they can afford to buy food, right? So as long as you can afford to buy it, then it's not a problem. So this is the issue. This is what happened. This was prediction 200 years ago. Well, this is what population did after Malthus's time. So Thomas Malthus is writing right here. This is the human population of the Earth. And it increased at an exponential rate on a global scale. Right? We went from 1 billion people in Malthus's time to, well, today about 7.5 billion people. Okay? But we're not starving because it turns out that our food production increased very rapidly also. So Projections of what would happen, we would run out of food. What really happened is no, we keep getting these increases in food production, just barely keeping up with demand. Concern is that we're now maybe looking at a point of no longer being able to do that. Right? The reason in the last century we were able to keep up with demand as populations grew so rapidly, and it really was the 20th century where populations really, really increased for humans, was this. 
these groups of researchers, private funders, government organizations got together and said, we need to address this issue or we're going to have global instability. We're going to have famines, we're going to have populations moving, kind of like we're getting out of Syria into Europe today, you know, the disruption that's causing. And so we have to address this. As a humanitarian cause, we need to address this. It's not okay for several hundreds of millions of people to starve to death. That's not okay. So let's start researching this. These groups got together. They ended up forming the Center for Maize and Wheat Improvement in the 1940s in Mexico. And I'll show you the technology they developed there, but what they did there was sort of amazing in terms of increasing food production. Uh, 1960s, we get the Erie uh, in Philippines aimed at rice production. Then we get the FAO and the World Bank kind of working globally to bring these efforts together. So what are the technologies? Well, one of the biggest problems with farming are pests. Pests eat your plants before you can eat your plants, right? And this is an issue. And if you've ever done any gardening, boy, pests can take out your entire crop, right? So in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, we started developing pesticides, things that kill pests, right? We started doing irrigation. And irrigation does two things. Irrigation allows you to farm land you couldn't farm before because it was dry. The soils may be good, maybe lots of sunshine, maybe it doesn't even frost there. Maybe you can grow two crops a year, but it's too dry to grow. But if we can put up a big dam over here and move the water to where it's dry, well, we can farm, right? The other thing irrigation does is, well, let's see, we usually have enough water, but this year we don't. We're having a bit of a drought. Well, if we've got irrigation in place, we don't lose our crop. Right? So it's crop insurance, and then it also allows us to expand how much land we're using. This is a map that sort of shows where we have lots of irrigation. If it's these colors, we're looking at 50 to 100% of the land under irrigation. And if you look at China and India, two of the biggest bread baskets in the world, there's lots of irrigation going on there. They're very highly dependent upon irrigation. Even in the United States, in the Midwest and the Southeast, we have a lot of irrigation. So this is a lot of food being produced by moving water around. We started using fertilizers in a way we hadn't used fertilizers before. And what this does is make our, basically, soil more productive, right? We start using mechanization. Instead of using handwork, we start using tractors. And you can farm a whole lot more area with one tractor and one person than you can using 10, 20, 30 laborers, right? Plus, it's cheaper. So we get fewer people working in the farm sector. They're able to go into cities and work there if they can find a job. But whole thing becomes cheaper and much larger. We can expand the size of our farms if we want to. Then we do this. People come up with high yielding varieties. Now people have been doing this for uh, about 8,000 years. This is not new, right? You're growing potatoes. You're in the Andes. And you notice that in this whole field over here, that plant's doing the best, okay? So which plant am I going to plant next year? The one that's doing the worst or the one that's doing the best? You save the one that's doing the best, you plant it next year, okay? Now, one step beyond that. What if I got a plant over here that seems to be resistant to stem borers? I'm growing rice, and there's these, these bugs that like to bore into the stems and suck all the juice out, right? Seems to be resistant to stem borers, right? But it doesn't do good with floods. This one over here has a longer stem. It's good with floods. If I cross these two, I'll get a plant that dies in the flood and gets eaten by stem borers. And I'll also get some plants that are resistant to stem borers and resist floods, right? So you crossbreed, you cross pollinate. This is a very, very old technology, but this is what the Green Revolution started doing in Mexico when they started trying to increase the production of corn there. And we get these super varieties. You find something that does something you like, survives floods with the light long stems, but not much rice on that, right? Cross it with something that produces lots of rice, and you get a plant that has longer stems and lots of rice, right? Nothing magical about that, it's just cross-pollination. This is what happened to wheat production in Mexico during the Green Revolution. A tenfold increase, that's 1,000% increase in wheat production in 20 years. That'll feed some folks, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it works pretty well. It had taken between the year 1,000 to the year 2,000 for farmers to increase yields by 100%. 1,000 years to increase yields by 100%. In 20 years, these guys produce yields, increase yields by 1,000%. Okay, this is 
is one of the reasons why we haven't had mass starvation. We don't only do this with corn, we do it with rice, we do it with other crops. We vastly increase how much we can produce. This is an indication of how much fertilizer we started using. If you go back to 1960, fertilizers increase, right? Often doubling, even tripling. If we look at how much irrigated land there, again, more than double the irrigated land just in 45 years, from 1960 to 2005. And the amount of pesticides used, well, we used to, oh, I'm sorry, this is exports, but it used to be down here, not very much at all, right? 1960 to now several, um, well, several tens of millions of tons. This is global food supply, 1961, 1997. This is uh, kilocals, it's basically calories, what we think of calories, right? So we take how many calories are produced in the world through agriculture and harvested, harvested, and then divide that by how many people there are, this is what we get. We produced enough food in 1961 for every human on Earth, on average, to eat about 2,100 calories a day. Can you get by on 2,100 calories a day? If you're not playing ultimate or some other very active sport, yeah, you probably can. You probably can. But look where we've gone. We've gone all the way up to 2,700 kilocalories calories per day on average. That's how much food we're producing. And if you're eating more than that, you better be running some also because that's more than most people need, right? So we, we've met. We've met the demand. What are the limits to the technologies? And this is, this is an issue that geographers are very keen on. We, we look at things critically. What are the limits? Okay, this is working. What would make it not work? What are the downsides of this? Let's look at this carefully. And this is something that, that markets aren't very good at. They look at what's working today and not what the long-term costs are. So our global footprint. This is a depiction of, for these parts of the world, of all of the photosynthesis, of all the plant growth that happens in that place, how much of it is eaten by humans. And if it's this color here, it's 70 to 80 percent of all of the trees, plants, grasses, weeds, everything are eaten by humans. Now, there are some places where, gee, humans aren't having that big a footprint, Amazon, right? But there aren't many humans here. And there's a whole lot of leaf production there, right? But then we have places where, think about where we have dense population. We have dense population in northern India. We have dense population in eastern China. We have dense population in Europe. And humans are eating just about everything there is there. It's hard being a bug in these places because <laughs> there's not much to eat because those humans keep eating it. Okay. This is another depiction. This, this person attempted to say, okay, let's look at the weight of all land mammals. And then we're going to choose a unit, one million tons. Each box is one million tons. And see, on the globe, how many tons of animals do we have? Mammals. Mammals do we have? Okay, so that's everything. How many tons, how many, what percentage of that, what portion of that is elephants? Ah, that's how much of all the mass of land animals in the world are elephants. Okay? Uh, horses over here, sheep are over here, pigs up there, this is cattle, and this is humans. And the only thing that's not a human product are, well, it's those green things on the outside there. This is the human footprint on the earth. Now, if we were to do this for insects, it'd be a totally different story, right? We don't use insects hardly at all, and there's about somewhere around 500 times more massive insects than there are mammals, but we don't use them very much. Do you eat insects intentionally? Okay. It's coming into our diets more and more, it seems now. Technology. What are the limits of technology here? Let's see. Pesticides. The idea of a pesticide is, well, you're killing life. That's right. Side is to kill. Pest is, that's something alive that you don't like. Pesticide. So if we're doing something that kills life, could that affect us in bad ways? This is how much pesticide we have been producing in the United States. So we have millions of metric tons over here, 1945, up like that. This is the value of the pesticides. It's billions of dollars produced every year. We're using a lot of pesticides in the United States. We're exporting a lot of pesticides from the United States. This is a depiction of atrazine use. Uh, 20, 2006, I think, hasn't changed much. Atrazine is a xenoestrogen. All right. Now, you've heard of estrogen? Yes? We have estrogen in our bodies. It's a hormone. What does estrogen tell your cells to do? Well, 
when you menstruate, you strip your endometrium, you get a new line into your uterus, breasts often swell, cells grow. Estrogen is a growth signal. It tells your cells to grow. Men have it too. We all have estrogen, right? What xenoestrogens do is they get into the plant and they say, grow, 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 grow. And the plants grow so fast that their vascular system can't keep up and they basically choke to death. It's a growth sig signal, okay? okay? And it works. It works on, this is for plants, not, not for insects. This is a study that shows where we have atrazine in our water supplies. Now, not that big a deal in California unless you're in the Central Valley, but boy, if you're in the Midwest, if you're in Texas, there's a lot of atrazine out there. Is it safe? Well, the scientific method says this. You hold everything else constant, you expose the subject to the agent and see if there's a change in the subject. Dependent, independent variable. Test for it, okay? Okay? Atrazine, you put that in some water, you put a frog in the water, frog's fine. Frog has babies, babies are fine. No problem, safe to use, yes? Now what if you're a geographer and you wanna think about this holistically? What could possibly cause a change to that atrazine as frogs interacted with it? What if you expose that atrazine to deadly ultraviolet radiation? Well, that's stupid, Jeff. How would you ever expose atrazine to deadly ultraviolet radiation? What? The sun? Oh my goodness, that's right. Atrazine gets exposure to sunlight, doesn't it? Oh, and that has UV radiation. And when you expose that, what you get is this. And it's not simple, because atrazine doesn't do this. Atrazine weakens the tadpole's immunity so that the nematodes that cause this genetic variation are able to invade its organism and cause this. So it's not even atrazine causing this. It's atrazine causing a change in the immune system which causes this. Right? Steps and steps and steps. It's complicated. It's complicated. Now, you would think that if you were going to produce a chemical in the United States, you'd want to test it for safety. Don't you think that'd be a good idea? Do you have any chemists in here? Oh, you're not going to admit it? Okay. I hope we have some chemists in here. We need chemists. If you wanted to produce a new chemical, formulate something that's going to have a good use to it, you should probably check it for its safety for humans, right? Well, if we do check it for safety, this is how we check it. You take the substance you're developing, you expose life to it, and you see if there's a change in life. You don't bother to think about ecologies or other things that might happen to the chemical. In the United States today, we have about 82,000 industrial chemicals being produced. 82,000. Most of these are from petroleum, carbon-based, which links to your cells really well. 82,000, about 1,400 have been tested for safety. 82,000 chemicals being produced in the United States today, 1,400, not 1,000, 1,400 have been tested for safety. And that's how they get tested, right? Expose the frog to it, see if anything happens. So we don't even look at it environmentally. So problems potentially with this. Estrogen's in you. So can you think of a illness that basically is characterized by your cells growing and growing and growing and growing out of control? Cancer is exactly that. Women's breast cancer in the United States. Lockstep with increase in atrazine and other xenoestrogen use in the United States has increased. Boys, not a concern? Sperm production in the United States. This is a feminine hormone. It feminizes masculine organisms. Sperm counts have been dropping and dropping and dropping. This didn't really concern Congress. When Congress got this, they got all upset about it. I wonder why. I wonder why. Um, irrigation, again, this is about extensifying land, more land under production, and then ensuring land in case we have a drought, right? So great for that. Increases production tremendously. One of the issues with irrigation is this, though. When water comes off the mountains, water is good at dissolving stuff, right? Do you wash dishes in water sometimes? Yeah. Do you use warm water or cold water? Warm, because warm is better at dissolving stuff. Water dissolves stuff. It's a great solvent. So as this water is running through the Sierra Nevadas, it's picking up little bits of minerals off those rocks, right? It's creating Yosemite Valley. It's eroding rocks away. You bring the water down into Fresno, and you irrigate your land with it, and the plants take it up, and it evaporates. The water evaporates off. But the minerals that were in the water, 
They don't evaporate, do they? Do you do that test, that, that thing in science class where you sprinkle salt in a beaker and then you boil off all the water and you get that crust of salt on it? Yeah, the salt stays. Now, do plants like salt? No, what salt does is it causes reverse osmosis. It causes water to be drawn out of the cell rather than allow the water to go into the cell. So salt, unless the plant's adapted to it, is a real problem. This is a depiction of where we have lands that are potentially agriculture that have too much salt in them to farm. Now, some of these are in deserts. The Sahara Desert, that's not human activity that caused that. Australia, very dry. But India, no. India's not a desert. And we have lost somewhere on the order of 77,000 square miles to salinization. Irrigation is this tremendously effective technology, but it has these side effects, right? These downsides. And as a result, we're losing land. Just at the time when we need to increase our food production, we're losing our ability to produce food. We have water shortages. So these are different drainage basins in the United States. If it's that dark red color, that means that we're drawing more water than the system can provide. And you can see there's a lot of the world, not all of the world, but there's a lot of areas that produce a lot of food where we're sucking more water out of the system than the system can provide on an ongoing basis. So again, vulnerability. This is a loss of resilience, right? Irrigation provides resilience. This decreases our resilience. How about fertilizer? We're using lots of nitrous oxides as fertilizers. Nitrogen is one of the first things that soils run out of. Phosphorus also, soils run out of that soon. This is the issue with uh, nitrogen fertilizer. You spread it on your crop with a tractor. Your plants take up between 4 and 8% of what you spread, right? Shh, grow really well, yes. What happens to the other 92, 94% of that nitrogen? Well, it rains, it dissolves in the water, it goes in the streams where it's, it's fertilizer. And the alga and the streams go, woohoo, nitrogen, and they grow, right? Which is fine to feed alga, no problem with that. Where the problem comes is when this water gets down to the ocean, and all of this nitrogen and phosphorus goes into the water, the ocean water there, and the alga goes, woohoo, let's grow. And it goes nuts. And this is actually from satellite using a particular sensor, alga growth. Now, there's no real problem with this, especially if you eat alga, it's great. The problem comes here. And again, thinking holistically, what's the life cycle of this thing? When the alga die, they float down towards the bottom and bacteria consume it, right? It's food for somebody. That's, it. That's how life works, right? Everything adapts to eat something. In the process of the bacteria eating the alga, it uses oxygen. It uses a lot of oxygen, to the point that there's not enough oxygen in this water for fish to breathe, or for shrimp to breathe. This is the most important shrimpery in the United States, off the coast of Louisiana. And due to having too much nitrogen in the water and what is called hypoeutrophication, we get these dead zones. Now, if we were only here, that would not be so much a problem, but here's a map of where we have dead zones in the world. Red means documented dead zones, hypoxic zones, not enough oxygen. Yellow is areas of concern. And this is where we have a lot of our fisheries. They're right there. We're decreasing the ability of our fisheries to produce food for us with the nitrogen we're putting on our cornfields. Now, should the fishers be able to sue the farmer who put the nitrogen on their field for the damage to their fishery? I'm not sure they're allowed. I don't think there's any mechanism for them to do that. How would you tell which farmer to sue, right? You have to sue all the farmers? How does the market react to this? Well, if there's fewer fish, what happens to the price of fish? Price goes up. Okay, that's good for fishermen. But now they only have half as many fish as they had before, so the price has to at least double for them. And then what does that do to the price of fish for you? So how do we work around that? Have you had tilapia? Anybody? Tilapia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tilapia is cool because it can eat anything. It can eat poop. It's great, right? It can. Yours probably did. <laughs> we farm fish. About half of the seafood we eat now globally is farmed. But if you start digging into farm fish, you find out that it turns out if you put a whole bunch of fish in a little kind of container, it's a great way to have a lot of disease in there. In order to knock that down, you've got to put in antibiotics, you've got to put in antivirals, and you've got all kinds of stuff. So there's all kinds of problems with farmed fish also. Point being, if you follow this out to this end point, we're often relying on technologies that 
themselves are problematic environmentally, that have limits. And the only way they can really keep going is if they externalize those bad effects. In the 1980s, we had a shift in how the Green Revolution worked. We started getting private corporations saying, there's money to be made here, and we have scientists working for us, and what we should do is we should start developing our own products here, and what we're going to do then is displace the Green Revolution. We're going to displace crossbreeding. We're going to displace public ownership. We're going to start institutionalizing private ownership. We're going to start marketizing these benefits. We're going to start internalizing profits. This is the business model, right? Agriculture then becomes not about producing food, it becomes about producing profit, which is okay unless you want food. This ends up defunding the Green Revolution. Public universities who are involved with this research often don't have the same funding they used to have. Some actually had to close. We get research that shifts to the private sector, which then owns their innovations. And if you own it, if you patent it, well, that's what a monopoly is. Don't tell anybody, but that's a monopoly. And what a monopoly allows you to do is charge as much as the market will possibly bear and no one can compete with you because you're the only one who sells it. It's like EpiPens going up for 400 bucks for a two-pack because only EpiPen makes EpiPens. They could do it because the market would bear it. Right? Is this good for you as a consumer? Not necessarily. Okay, mechanization. We start having bigger and bigger tractors, combines. We start using GPS to guide these things, more technology, fewer and fewer workers, for field crops at least. But to pay for this stuff, you can't have 400 acres anymore. To pay for this $125,000 machine, you've got to have 800 acres. You've got to have 1,600 acres. So we start going more and more towards industrial farms. Small farmers go away to a large degree. This is a depiction in Sub-Saharan Africa. This area we're looking at is about half again as large as the United States. People forget how big Africa is. All of Africa is one-fifth of all the dry land in the world, right? This is a very large area. Where we have red, we have very small farms. Where we have yellow, we have small farms. Family size, not big enough for a family, medium size. Not a large farm, not a lot of large farms. In Sub-Saharan Africa, small farming is still how food is produced. Right? So it's interesting to kind of watch what happens here. I'll get back to that in just a little bit. How are large farms doing? Well, this is from Canada, 1970, 2005. This is Canadian agro-food exports. Did exports increase or decrease? It increased. It increased quite a bit from, well, that's billions of dollars, from $2 billion up to $25 billion. This is about Canada increasing their farm output. How are farmers doing with all of this extra production here? This is not Canada. It's Saskatchewan, 1926-2006. And let's see, that red mark up there is 20,000 a year per farm. This is a $20,000 year loss per farm. Here's the depression. Not so good, right? We got the depression though, and yeah, farming's pretty good. We're making 20, 40, 60, until we get to privatization. And what happens to the farm income then? How can you stay in business if you're losing $20,000 a year? How do you stay in business? This is life for a lot of farmers. How do you stay in business? Well, you get your congressperson to get farm subsidies for you. In order for the agribusiness companies to suck up all the profits, we have to subsidize the people actually producing the food. In essence, we're subsidizing agro-corporations. That's where the money's going to. The same way that we have to subsidize a worker at Burger King who's been there for two years as a ship supervisor in Brooklyn is still getting eight fifty an hour. And the only way she can live is by having food stamps and housing subsidies and Medicaid, which are paid for by your tax dollars, which go to the people who own the corporations. Right? This is neoliberalism. This is about the beauty of the market and what we don't see. This is about market control. So this is from a few years ago, but if in the United States, you were going to sell beef, you would sell globally. In the United States, 81% of all beef was purchased by Tyson, ConAgra, Cargill Farmlands. 
if you're selling pork in the United States, 59% of all pork was purchased by Smithfield, Tyson, ConAgra, Cargill. If you're selling broilers, Tyson, Gold Kiss, Pilgrim's Pride, ConAgra, corn exports, 81%, Cargill, ADMs, and NOAA. Do you see a pattern here? We have large companies that are controlling the purchase of farmers' production. Do you suppose they ever talk about where they're going to pay farmers this year? Oh, they wouldn't do that. That'd be against free markets, wouldn't it? Free markets have to compete for the best price. Yes? Most of these companies are privately held. They're not corporations. They don't have to publish jack. And they get together every year and have cocktails and talk about what the price for coins going to be this year in the United States. They set the price just as low as they possibly can without killing the farmers. This is the free market. We don't have high yielding seeds so much anymore. We're going to genetically modified organisms, right? And the rise of contract farming. I won't go into GMOs, it's too complex, but contract farming is this. When you buy a seed from Monsanto, you don't really own the seed. You rent the seed. You can't plant that seed next year. They'll sue you. They'll put you out of business. It's their seed. And more and more, farmers don't even own their land. They're leasing the land. The profit goes to the people who have monopolized, monopolized the organism, and the farmer basically babysits this. And the same thing's happening with animal farming. A lot of chicken farmers no longer actually own their chickens. Tyson supplies them with the young chicks. They raise them. They get paid a certain amount for having to survive, and off they go. The cheaper they can raise them, the better off they are the worse off the chickens are, of course. And now we're changing the climate. And remember that food kind of is dependent on climate, right? So this is where we have water stress projected by, well, eight years from now, 2025. If it's this color, we're going to have high stress for water. If it's that color over there, we're going to have lower stress for water. There's not a lot of blue on this map. There's a lot of green near normal. But there's a lot of red. These are places that are expected to have higher and higher water stress for agriculture. And if you look at eastern China and northern India, and that area just south of the Sahara, this is where a lot of the world's food is produced. And they're looking at having more and more water stress, drier conditions, warmer conditions, which causes evaporation to increase. This is a map that shows increased temperatures. Uh, if it's this color, it's going to increase by 50%. If that color, it's going to drop by 50%. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. This is tropical production as a result of change in temperature. So we have some green here, right? Look at that green spot above Mongolia. Yeah, they're going to, boy, they could double the agricultural production up there. How much agricultural production do they have now? Do you know anything about the area north of Mongolia? It's called Siberia. The growing season is about five days long. Ooh, we're going to go from one apple to two. Okay, the areas that are red are where the food's coming from, and that's where we're looking at decreases in food production. And this is why some of us are working so hard to address climate change. Other effects on crop production, well, storms, droughts, that sort of thing. This is a depiction of uh, basically natural disasters. You can see there's an increase in earthquakes, not very big, just from 100% to 150%. We don't have more earthquakes. We just have more people, so more damage from the earthquakes. But boy, if we look at meteorological events, droughts, hydrological events, floods, climatological events, long-term droughts, increasing, 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 right? We've got data for this. Farmers are stressed. Farmers are smart, but they're stressed. And it's not just the land. It's the oceans, because we do get food from our oceans, right? Some people depend very heavily on their oceans. This is one of the issues with these ideas of geoengineering, of putting stuff in the atmosphere that would reflect sunlight away. If you leave the carbon in the atmosphere, the carbon gets sucked up by the oceans. And as it gets sucked up by the oceans, well, it forms carbonic acid. The oceans become more acidic. And what happens to a shell of a plankton that's in higher acidity is the shell dissolves in the ocean water. And the plankton is the basis of the food chain. Some place in their lives, whatever is eating something in that ocean, that thing ate that thing that ate that thing that ate some plankton. If you take out the basis of the food chain, then you don't have groupers, you don't have whales, you don't have sharks, you don't have anything. Dory goes away, and we don't find her again. Oh, that gotcha. <laughs> we also have warming, and that's what's going on here, right? Corals are adapted to temperatures. Unlike land where it's 
Okay, so what, it was 45 degrees this morning when I got up. It's supposed to be 75 this afternoon. 30 degree shift, that doesn't happen in oceans. We're looking at two or three degrees, four degrees, five degrees, maybe throughout the year. It's very stable, right? Corals are very adapted to a certain temperature of water. If it goes three, four, five degrees above that, it gets sick. It has to expel the uh, alga that makes this wonderful color and it dies. A lot of our food spends its young life, like dory, amongst uh, corals. People say that the way to address this is through markets. And what I argue, if you take my classes, is this. Markets don't feel a lot of this. It doesn't enter the market, right? Environmental degradation, coal mining, the bads of that, it doesn't get into the market, right? So the market can't address it. If you put it into the price of coal, yeah, okay, then the market can, can handle it. Monopolies are not addressed by markets. What's the natural result of competition? Darwin competition. What's the natural result of competition? What's that? Equilibrium? Equilibrium? No, in the Super Bowl, is that the natural? Winner and loser. Yeah, winner and loser. Winner and loser. Ecological equilibrium, yes, you're right. <laughs> winner and loser. We call that a monopoly in the business world, right? The cost of disease resulting from environmental degradation, your breast cancer as a result of xenoestrogens, does that go into the market? Heck yes, it's good. You just, you spent $40,000 on your breast cancer treatment. Woohoo! GDP goes up. Oi, right? If you are starving, that means you probably don't have enough money to buy food. If you don't have enough money to buy food, does the market feel your demand? No, because you don't have enough money to buy food. That describes about 2 billion people today. Day to day, not necessarily enough money to buy food. So what's at stake? Well, our biosphere is at stake. Our food production is at stake. In 20 years, we could be looking at 2 billion people looking at starvation. That's what's at stake. These aren't my figures. These are somebody else's figures. And I personally do not want to live in a world watching 2 billion people starve to death. I would rather drive less. I bought an electric hybrid bicycle so I could ride my bike to, to work from Santa Rosa. I don't go to the city's office I might like. I ride public transportation. Change your behaviors. Other things too. So what can you do? Terrible things. Annie Leonard wrote this book about stuff about 15 years ago, and she argues here brilliantly that we too often think of ourselves as consumers, right? When in fact what we need to do is think about ourselves as citizens. So we can't really address these by changing what we buy only. We have to start organizing, start thinking about how can we get institutions to change, laws to change? How can we get civil society and governments to start doing the right thing, right? How do we get politically active? How do we change the things that we don't like? You can do things like this. Find a cause that you feel is important and put your energy into supporting that. Small farmers using agroecology, which I'll talk about in just a minute here, are a way to produce food and actually make the biosphere more resilient. Right? Talk about that in just a minute. So you could help people do more agroecology. This is an example of agroecology. The United Nations Environment Program, that sounds pretty important, doesn't it? They did a study with scientists, PhDs and everything, right? And they went to Nairobi, Kenya, and they looked at bacteria and fungi in the soil with their microscopes and stuff. And what they found was that if you don't kill them, the soil's 50% more productive. If you don't use pesticides to kill all the stuff living in the soil, the soil is 50% more productive. In other words, if you start trying to form equilibrium with the stuff that lives there and figuring out how can we cultivate the things that we like and suppress the things that bother us, we could have a much more vital, resilient, livelier system, right? Agroecology. Agroforestry, you have trees and ground crops, right? Think about this. Coffee grows in a lot of tropical areas. Coffee, coffee makes nicotine. No, caffeine, 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 right? I like caffeine, you can probably tell that. Yeah. <laughs> Why does a coffee or a tea tree make caffeine? Just for me. When a bug eats a coffee tree leaf, the bug gets a tummy ache. Caffeine gives a tummy ache. Oh, I'm not going to eat that anymore. Bzz. Doesn't kill the bug, 
It just discourages a bug. Now, if I've got a chemical that kills that bug, ha, it's gone, it's dead. I don't have to worry about it anymore, right? But do I kill all 10,000 bugs in my field that year? Are a couple genetically predisposed to survive my poison? Who has babies next year? The dead bugs or the two that survive my poison? Next generation, going to be pretty good at surviving my poison, right? Coffee trees, they figured that out a long time ago. No, you don't kill the bugs, you just discourage them, right? That's why trees and plants make these substances we find so interesting. Coca trees, for example. Uh, uh, tobacco, other trees. So agroforestry. You have some trees going around your plants. The trees help repel the things that your plants might, that might eat your plant. Um, green composting. Instead of throwing away your stems from last year, you compost it. You mix some animal poop in with it. You vary what you grow there. This season we're going to have uh, peas and beans which fix nitrogen in our soil. We're going to harvest that, and the next season we're going to allow our sheep and our goats to go through it and eat the stalks from the peas and the beans. They're going to poop and make brown fertilizer for us. So we've got nitrogen from the peas and beans. We've got poop, phosphorus. We're set to go when we grow our food plants for us, right? So, oh, and guess what? We use the sheep and the goats and the cows because they produce milk for us, right? Things like this, finding ways to live with life, to have more life on the land, is what agroecology is all about. This study is a, a compendium of a bunch of other studies that looked at 29 million acres, which is 45,000 square miles, which isn't much in South Africa, but that's a lot of space. It's about the size of the Central Valley. And what they found was that, hmm, yields increased about double. Decrease use of pesticides, decrease use of fertilizers, decrease your cost, start using life to help do what life does, and we doubled our production. Okay, that's what agroecology is about. Other things you could do. You could put pressure on people in power to stop supporting non-export agriculture, to grow food for us, and to stop pressuring developing countries to grow only exports, but food for them, more local kinds of constructs. We could have a demand on carbon tax. So what this would be would be a couple of cents for every pound of carbon that goes into whatever it is that you're buying, and you pay that. And the countries that drop their carbon footprint, well, they'll have to pay less tax, right? So through your purchases, you could actually reward the people who are having a lower carbon footprint. You could start using mass transit. Did you know that our bus system in Sonoma County is free for you as students? Do a lot of you ride the bus? No. Is it convenient to ride the bus? Not for everybody. If we all started riding the bus, they'd start putting more buses out there. They'd run more often, they'd go to more places, right? It's about demand. It's about changing what we're doing. Right? Um, we need a different energy infrastructure if we're going to have solar. The centralized production doesn't work so well. We could lead a legal right uh, challenge to patent life, to patent seeds. All these things are things you could do. You could write a letter to President Xi or Modi or Obama for agreeing to de decrease greenhouse gases through the Paris Accord. We'll see what President Trump does with that. Or you could ask President Trump to support the clean energy plan, which he's trying to undo right now. If you want it to be different, you've got to do something. And you can't do it by yourself. You got to organize. So who do you call? Well, you want to know who your congressperson is, who your senator is, your state representative. You go to Common Cause. You put in your information, it'll tell you the addresses and the emails for all those people. Write them letters. Letters work. Phone calls are really good. Jam up the lines. Um, you can go to this, Indivisible. Indivisible is a group of people after the last election who said, OK, we just got screwed. Th these are people who are more on the left of the political scale. Um, how did the Tea Party do that? How did they do that? Because really, that, that small minority of Americans, they, they really upset things. How did they do that? And so what these folks did is they, they reverse engineered. They hacked the Tea Party. And what they have here is a manual for what the Tea Party did and how you can do it to do what you want to do, right? In Santa Rosa and Roanoke Park, there's a group of people who meet every week with Indivisible. They have events. You can get involved with them if you want. The idea is that if you don't change what you're doing, things are going to keep going the way they're going. And the way things are going are a little bit scary. <laughs> I think. So, some things to think about, if you want, are these. I'll just leave these up. Do you have any questions? We've got about three minutes. Do you have any questions I can address for you? Question. 
Yeah? What about genetically modified organisms? So this is about three weeks of, of discussion <laughs> and reading. The, the issue with GMOs is that they are patented. And because they are patented, farmers lose power and control and, and profitability as a result. Monsanto does great, and Genentech does great. Interestingly, about 95% of all patents that have been filed, now think about this, you could try to genetically modify an organism to be more salt tolerant that could grow in these salinized soils. That would be good, right? You could genetically modify an organism that would resist rust, fungus of some sort. That would be good, right? 95% of all patents for genetically modified organisms having to do with agriculture have been to be resistant to pesticides made by Bayer, Monsanto, and Genentech. 95% of all patents are to patent a plant that can withstand an herbicide. So the potential's there, but we're not using it because we defunded our public institutions. We don't have public research into this stuff these days. Not as much as we could anyway. Other questions? Yes, Scott. So yeah, there's a lot of org there's there's many arguments about organic and what organic means and what organic means in California now is shit. There there are things you can use organic farming that won't really damage the land, but as soon as it hits the water, it kills fish and it kills fish for three months. And those are organic certified okay. California organic has become totally taken over by the agro industry. Okay, so that's why I refer to agroecology, um, alternative agriculture. Does it require more land? Is it less productive? It can be, especially in the transition from commercial, traditional to alternative agriculture. It can be. Does it use more labor? It does. It does use more labor. Do we have folks in the world who need jobs? Do you know what the unemployment rate in Kenya is? It's about 35% because people started using tractors instead of using labor on the land, right? Do you think we use any laborers in the United States for farms? Yeah, we do, we do. Yeah, it is, it's labor intensive. But the idea is, well, maybe it's not such a bad thing to work on a farm. So you can go to Full Belly Farms over by Central Valley, coming out of the big lake up there. And when you drive in the driveway, you'll see about 10, 15 cars. Uh, there's a new F-150, a new Mustang, a new Camaro. And I'm going, why are they all these fancy cars here? And then I do the tour of the farm. It's organic. And um, the folks who are driving those cars are full-time laborers. They work at the farm. They make about $55,000 a year. And boy, they're producing a lot of food on that land. And they're doing it all without chemicals and pesticides. They're doing it with agroecology. So yeah, more labor but it's 55,000 a year. And if you have only a high school education, 55 a year is not too bad in the Central Valley. Right? Last question is why don't we have more geographers? This is what geography does. This is one of the things we do. It's not state capitals, right? <laughs> if it's interesting, take a class. We have GE classes you might enjoy. <laughs> I'm done, thanks.